Hi, I'm Dave Barnes. And I'm John McLaughlin. And welcome to Dadville. Dadville is a podcast where we talk about life, love, and the pursuit of awesome dadding. It's funny thoughts and deep talks. So please, enjoy your time here in Dadville and enjoy this episode with... Sissy Gove. Folks, we're just going to jump right in today. Let's Sissy, we're, right we're going we're gonna, to... Um, what do they say? Uh, dispose of the pleasantries. <laughs> oh no! Because folks, I've never, I've never heard that phrase. Before. Thank you. <laughs> I read a lot. I do. You. That's I do. good. I do. I do. I do. I do. Um, Dave, and, what are you reading right now? Um, yes. So <laughs> the Bible. I don't feel <laughs> Sissy's Bible. Oh, Sissy's new book. Of course, yeah, I'm reading. Come on. We've been doing this a Y'all. long time. We read each other's minds. <laughs> And that's apparently that's the only thing we read because I didn't know. It. Hey, see what I did there. Um, so, so everybody, we have. Um, is it the co-mayor? What have we? No, told y'all gave me my own title. What was it? Oh, what was it? I can't. He's remember. the mayor. You're the governor. The oh, governor. Yeah. Okay. He, sure. Wow. I don't know. I'm going to go with that. <laughs> okay, that feels good I, I on like Monday. That. Huh? Okay. Um, okay. We're excited to have you back. I'm so excited to be back with y'all. Of the echelon of people that we have on Dadville who know what they're talking about, mm. there is a Mount Rushmore of those. And you and David are two of them. Yep, two of them. Wow. Yeah. You each have wow. you're on four twice. heads. You're, you both are on there twice. <laughs> <laughs> it's like happy sissy, no. <laughs> mad sissy, happy David, mad David. <laughs> so... So um, oh, we're thrilled to have you back. I'm I mean, so it glad is... to be back. And now I feel like I'm officially friends with both of you. So Definitely. I'm you... not nervous. I no. used to be nervous. Oh, why? I don't know. Because y'all are so funny. I can't keep up with you. Well, that's Listen, it's, I want to say this. It's a burden and it's a blessing. And that's what people don't know <laughs> is they sure. just think, what's it like to just be who you Hilarious. are? Hilarious. Both of you. It carries a weight. It yeah. carries a very real yeah, weight. Yeah, sure. So you do have a new book out. I do. And now I'm realizing I didn't write down what it's called. And that's how professional I am. And I was Wait. just going to riff until it came to me. I will say I am the worst at remembering titles of books. Oh, y'all. Oh, no, matter. I know it. I know it. I know it. It's a worry-free, The Worry-Free Parent. Oh, John, that was Close? good. That was it. That was it? Yes. The no, Worry-Free Parent. Really that? Yes, that's good. Yeah, The Worry-Free Parent. Yeah. In the subtitle. Count. I just said it. Living in confidence so your can your kids can't too. Yep. Boom. Dave only remembers the subtitles. <laughs> he doesn't remember. So I'm great with movies on Netflix. Um we so obviously I can't think of uh which I'm assuming is one of the reasons you read the book, a more applicable mm. <laughs> thing to write about in these in this day and time that we're living in. Um so I want to jump in and do this because I feel like People, if they've clicked on this episode, they're like, the less that Dave and John talk, the better. Let Sissy talk. <laughs> yep. So here we go. So it, far, we're not off to a great start. Yeah, we're, <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're already abusing our power already. Oh, um, so Sissy, we are. Let me, I guess I have, to, I have to say the foremost people like <laughs> just Sissy Goff, who is a Nashville um, legend. Oh. Um, so and uh, a huge part in helps run Daystar here in Nashville, which we love and and p- participate with. Okay, so so one of the things I kind of want to start here. Um, y- these are facts that you've said and we, we've we've uh, that are part of the book that we've talked about before, but I think worth saying again. One in four kids today is dealing with anxiety. The average age for the onset of anxiety is seven. Yes, which is crazy. That blew crazy. my mind. I oh, know, makes me sad. Yeah, and, and it's. Both of my kids, like my youngest, just turned eight. So as I read mm. that, I'm like, "Well, it's done." Yeah, it's like <laughs> it's too late. <laughs> the door is. Oh I, no! If I would have read this years ago, I'd be like, "Okay, there's still time. I can, can stop it. I can <laughs> stop it." But it's like, no, it's no. Too late. I was too busy playing tennis and mowing my yard in that door. <laughs> um, and making coffee on Instagram, and, and I'm terrible <laughs> at both. <laughs> I'm not even good at either one. Of those um, and then this, this, this is very crazy. Me, girls are twice as likely to mm. suffer from anxiety. Yeah, yeah. and um, thankfully I have two girls. Yeah, so John so is yeah. coming in hot there. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, and boys are taking to get help more. What? Yeah, yeah. Not I wild. read that. Yeah. Oh my gosh! I want to guess why that's inferred, but you yeah. tell me why it is. I want to hear your guess first. Because I think it is not culturally normal for a boy to feel things so when they do mm-hmm. we need to fix mm-hmm. them yeah where yeah. a girl it's okay if they feel things 
that's definitely part of it. Yeah. Dang, I think, I to be no, well, <laughs> <laughs> Dave, that is interesting, but wrong. <laughs> no. Which would be the name no. of my book. That's definitely a, a small, small part of it. So small that. People don't really say that. Dave, I asked a five-year-old girl the other day, and that's exactly what she said. Y'all. And English is not her native language. (laughs) No, I think that's definitely true. And I think for boys, often it comes out as anger. Oh, gotcha. And so parents are more alarmed. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And anxious girls are typically... Very well functioning. They're the ones in parent teacher conferences that the teacher says, I wish every child in my class acted just like your daughter. Jeez. Really? Mm-hmm. And so they huh. just fly below the radar. And I think they're hard at home, but parents just think, oh, something's wrong at home rather than she has anxiety. Wow. Huh. Well, you know, I mean, with, with our girls, Amy and I have said before, like, they are. Tell Amy I said hi. I will. I will. You might see her later on mm-hmm. today, actually. They are. Angels at school. Yeah. And then when they can come home, my sweet little angels of, of daughters are not necessarily the easiest. You yes. Know? I like that you had to say daughters. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just to really get Amy out of the... <laughs> yeah. My girls. Um, but I, I, I've always felt like as, as hard as it can be at times, I'm like, I'm glad that the, the house is a mm-hmm. place where like the lab. they can function yeah the house is the, the lab. lab they can go to That's school and function and, and even when i say function i, I you know i want to stop and be like it's not like i want them to put on some performance or show when right. they're at school i don't want them to be inauthentic but they can sit in class they can listen they can do their work they can you know get along with other kids and adults and then they can come home and they can kind of let their emotions fly. Yes. Which I feel like is a healthy sign somewhat. It is a- <laughs> Your face. <laughs> right? It is. And that's, yes, John, you're so intuitive as yeah. a dad. I have known that about you for a long time, and that is exactly right. But you're, well, it's and good and healthy and most a compliment of what I say, to y'all. Most of what I say is just I'm <laughs> repeating something Amy said, but I'm like, <laughs> I never would have thought of that. But you're saying, with girls who struggle with anxiety, they often look on the outside exactly what I just described about yes. my girls. Mm. Yes. Okay. Yes. Delightful, kind, mm-hmm. bright, conscientious, all of those things. And why is it that they, they struggle so much more than, than boys do? That girls are more anxious? I think there's never been as much pressure on girls as there is. Wow. And I think there's pressure in general, but I think girls... It resonates differently with girls. Like, what is that pressure? Well, I mean, we could certainly talk about social media, but I think it starts Mm -hmm. way before social media even comes into play. And, you know, it's like the amount of kids now in Nashville, if your child is going to private school, there's a test called the IC. Mm -hmm. The amount of kids that I see that are having anxiety about the IC and in tutoring about the IC which never Mm -hmm. used to be a thing, not judging anyone who has their kids in tutoring for the IC. I I get it. But it just, it feels like that whole kindergarten is the new freshman year in college. You know, academically, there's so much pressure. They're supposed to excel at everything Mm -hmm. they do. I think that kids don't know how to define themselves, I think, in a lot of ways anymore. And so they're looking for places to do Do, that. Do you think some of that is because, we've talked about this, um, we just had, uh, oh, somebody we had on. We do so many. <laughs> anyway. No, but um, we were talking about um, how that shift from generations, and I think yes. our generation is so much more child-focused. Yes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, which has that to was, be... Uh, Dr. Morgan. That's right. Cutlip. That's yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Um, but just, you know, I, I do wonder if that's some of that. It's just mm-hmm. that it, now we're so child-centric. Yes, we are. That mm-hmm. the, they just feel the pressure, the pressure. of that. Yeah. yeah. Is there definitely. anything also to... Uh, you know, the fact that the, so the girls are twice as likely to to struggle with anxiety than than boys are. I feel like boys are allowed to be hmm. disagreeable mm. more than girls wow. are. Mm-hmm. Would you say yes. just just in general? Absolutely. It's like the boys, are, if they are going against some kind of grain, whether it be the grain of their household or the grain of their school or the grain of whatever, there's this sort of I don't know, subconscious, like, well, well, you're a pioneer. 
you're, you're you know, He's you forge cowboy. your own way. Wow. And this will be good for him later in life. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And girls maybe are supposed to subliminally be given, compliant. Yeah, Man. be right. be agreeable. Right. Which I do think culturally. It's fascinating to me because I feel like we've never talked as much about empowering girls. We've never mm-hmm. talked about helping mm-hmm. girls be mm-hmm. honest, mm-hmm. talk about their feelings. And at the same time, I'm not seeing it trickle down. Yeah. yeah. So I don't think it's as much in our messaging sometimes as I think it's right. just what they're absorbing yeah, still yeah, somehow. Yeah, yeah, uh, Even at the osmotic level. Yeah. Just well, like the I don't know what that word means. Well, somebody Thank said. <laughs> I had to say it today to Andy. You pronounced Jared. it correctly. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Somebody said the other day on on – some interview that I was listening to, they were saying, we, we do have m- seemingly more than ever all, all these messages to women, empowering women. That's, a, that's great. All of that is great. They, they were saying when girls, women in various spaces actually start to own into and step up and, and take space, we don't actually like that. And they, their point was, if men, and they're speaking very generally, obviously, but if men really believed in this movement of women being empowered, the natural, there would be some natural threat behind it. Mm. And his point was, we don't feel like there's really teeth in this. It's more lip service being done because we're not threatened by, like, yeah, women run the world. There would be a natural like, well, wait, hang on a minute. Like, if you guys are really going to come in and start changing stuff, mm. we would feel more threatened by it, you know? That's fascinating. Well, I mean, I, I, you know, our culture it, patriarchally has been the world. It's the history right. of the world. So yeah. it's, you can't come in and say, like, women are about to take the baton. It's like, no, 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 no. Yeah. This is we, like the thousands of years of yeah. being this way. It's not like mm. all of a sudden – some really smart, wonderful leadership oriented women are going to be like, Oh, it shifted overnight. I mean, it's literally the Titanic, you know, it's like mm-hmm. Rome wasn't built in the day, whatever you, mm-hmm. know, you want to say, but mm-hmm. it's, so I think it's, it's, it's how we all think about it, whether we like it or not, everybody, mm-hmm. you yeah. just think that way. It's like, so, I mean, I think turning that around would be so, and it can happen in small things, but I think, I think we underestimate how much our world is set up in the way that it's set up. Yeah, I agree. And I also that I think, when we say some of the things that we're saying, which again are all, I, I'm all for it. I think sometimes we don't think, okay, let's think of an example where this act- actually has real world teeth, where this is really actually going to mm-hmm. impact our world. And then how does that feel? Mm-hmm. We got to be okay with that too. We got to mm-hmm. see some of those yeah. changes, mm-hmm. you know? Well, this may be a whole side thing, but I mean, where I would like to see part of the change Mm. is there is this fascinating thing that happens that I watch happen every summer with kids Mm. where, you know, we have this little summer Mm. retreat program Mm -hmm. for kids Mm -hmm. in counseling at Daystar called Hope Town. And Mm -hmm. we have something for the second through fourth and fifth and sixth graders called man school. Oh, wow. And these guys, they're so cute. They get so excited about it and they learn to shake hands and tie ties. And I think Aaron teaches them to cook and they, Use the blower. I mean, I don't know all the things they do. <clears throat> Talk about conversation, how to have conversations, so many different great things. So we have struggled over the years with what to call the girls' equivalent. Oh, wow. Because if we called it woman school, girls wouldn't want to come. Really? They don't, mm. There's not, there's something Jeez. little boys feel like, I get to be a man. Uh-huh. David tells the story when we do the Raising Boys and Girls seminar about I won't tell the whole story because David should tell it some next time he's here, but about this boy who's entering puberty and the dad says, when this happens, I want you to make me up. We're going to have a steak dinner because you're, God's making you into a man. It's this beautiful story. And we were teaching together one time somewhere and some woman came up to me and she said, okay, so I tried to do that with my daughter. And I said, you know, when you start your period, I want you to come and find me and I'm going to buy you a purse and we're going to go celebrate because I'm so excited about the fact that God is making you into a woman. Mm. And she said, my daughter said, really, mom, we're going to celebrate the fact that I'm bleeding. Wow. That interesting. Mm -hmm. And I think there's Mm. something for girls about becoming women Mm. that there's this 
maybe shame takes it too far. Mm. Although I think there is a little bit of that, but, yeah. but definitely it's an ambivalence. Mm. It's this, mm-hmm. I don't even know what that means. Yeah. What are the really good things? And so I think, mm. I mean, I think obviously culturally we need to do some things, but I think in our homes we yeah. need to do some things. I woke up this morning and there was a uh-huh. thought that I couldn't shake. Okay. I mean, I ate my cereal. I was thinking about it. I went on my run. I was thinking about it. Yeah. I yep. watched you go on your run. I don't mm-hmm. know if you knew that. And I was thinking yeah, about yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. Well, I know your car. And you were right next to me. <laughs> you kind of ignored me, so I didn't know if you knew I was there, even though I bumped you a couple times. Um, how was your ankle, by the way? Here's the thought I kept having. Yeah. Knock around is is the original. This is exactly how it is in my head. <laughs> Knock around is the original affordable sunglasses company offering quality shades that bro- won't break won't the bank. Won't break the bank. That's what yes. I was thinking the whole morning. Yes, I, I, I could. You know what? I could tell you were thinking it. Yeah. When you were in your Lambo, mm-hmm. the Gini, <laughs> as you call it, the Gini. Yeah. I could see kind of through gene. the tinted windows, and yeah, I yeah. could tell. You know what? He's mm-hmm. thinking about knock around. Yeah. yeah. You know, and let me add to that because okay. knock around sunglasses they're available in seventeen different frame styles all right also a ton of different color combinations Mm -hmm. and are offered with both standard uv 400 protection and polarized lenses and here's what i don't want you to forget okay okay knock around also has kid-sized sunnies Mm, for the little ones never forget that and they're always releasing new sunglasses so check out knockaround.com for latest releases i was was thinking about that dave i'm already there okay you think that i'm like reading this on my phone no no no. i'm at knockaround.com oh well okay and look a new release just in time for the playoffs in October. Oh, wow. Major League Baseball Premium Sports Sunglasses. Do they have mm. Dodgers, yes. Yankees, yes. Cubs, yes. Cardinals, yes. the Dragon Fighters, Kung Maybe. Fu Johnny, and the Get Back Girls? <laughs> all my favorite They're MLS teams. Yeah, okay. And all with team logos and colors. That sounds like a grand slam, oh, look Dave, that. just I to use it. I'm, I'm keeping that. the sports references you going. Kill it. I might just have to order a pair of knockarounds for the whole I dare family. You. I dare you. Way to knock it out of the park. <laughs> Whoa. Come on. Come on. We're just playing a little verbal gymnastics here. Just Well, it's not really gymnastics. It's more um, <laughs> ping pong. Ping pong. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, yeah. That's Pickleball, that. if you will. Pickleball. Thank Tennis. you. Dave. More current. Um, now, can I ask you a question though, really quickly? Please. Please. How can our listeners find their favorite pair? Okay. Look, here's what you do, all right? And now I'm speaking directly to the listener right Okay, now. okay. Oh, yeah, Since me. you are a loyal Dadville listener, you or, or listener, yeah, no, plural or singular, <laughs> if you're single, if you're married, <laughs> dating, whatever, you can head over to the knockaround.com and use the promo code DADVILLE15 anytime, but, but do it now, mm-hmm. for 15% off your order. Yeah, go to knockaround.com and use the promo code DADVILLE15 for 15% off your first order of an awesome new pair of sunglasses. Seven. 58. Oh, man. 59. Oh, you did it. <sighs> Woo, man. That was awesome. You successfully ate three <laughs> banana cream pies in under one minute. Oh, man. I Amazing. Knew. And I was counting slow. Well, everybody Trying said I couldn't you. do it, but I knew I had it. I, I found a rhythm. Yeah. It was on. I mean, you, you know, John, it's just that's the most unhealthy thing I probably could have done in under a minute. But but am I regretting it? Yes. But am I a little impressed with myself? Also, I, yes. I couldn't agree more, yeah. Dave. Honestly. But, John. Do you know what the healthiest thing you can do in under? Oh, we're going the other side. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to I teach mean, you a lesson. A hundred percent, I know. Oh, that's easy. Uh, what kind Should of- we say it at the same time? Yes. AG1 by Athletic Greens. John and I gave AG1 a try because we wanted increased energy, better gut health, and we wanted a supplement that actually tastes great. Now listen, Dave, I don't know about you. Okay. Okay? Okay. But I take AG1 while I'm making my morning coffee. It's all one thing. You know what I mean? And I love that it helps me with improved digestion. You know how much I want to improve my digestion. You talk about it all the time. All the time. Mm -hmm. And my sleep support. That's huge. Plus... Why take a bunch of different things when you can just mix one scoop of powder and water every day? I know, I know. AG1 is powerful because it's so easy to fit into your lifestyle. The all-in-one formula makes it easy for you to cover your nutritional bases every day. And AG1 is delivered to your doorstep. Again, we can't stress this They're enough. Not They're not going to leave it in the yard no. or put it two doors down. Even if they did, though, that it would be a great deal because it's worth it. They're not going to put it in the mouth of a neighborhood dog and then slap the rear to watch it run off. Right. No, it's not the 90s anymore. 
It deli- they deliver it right to your doorstep every month, so it's been super easy to make a, da- a daily habit of it. <laughs> oh, well, you got me in the Google box, John. <laughs> if you're looking for an easier way to take supplements, AG, that's right, Athletic Greens is giving you a free one-year supply of vitamin D and five tr- free travel packs with your first purchase. So go to athleticgreens.com slash dadville. That's athleticgreens.com slash dadville. Check it out. It's so funny because I was like, what would be the equivalent of that for a guy? Obviously, there's not, uh, uh, there's a lot of physical things that are happening, but nothing like what a girl goes through. Yes. But I think, you know, the equivalent to me is like where you would sit and say to a woman, like you're taking on all this responsibility, it's hard. I, I, there's a million things you'd say to a boy, I think, in the same way, which is like God, Christ calls us to be the chief sacrificers and repenters as men, right? Like that's as the, as the dad you want to lead your family it is hard and like terrifying and vulnerable and so i think the thing that gets i think in that moment that miscommunication can be like men we we seize and we go where it's like biblical manhood is just as terrifying Mm. because it's like this is it's going to be against your inertia almost all the time you know, like with Adam, you think about Adam, the, the, the silence of Adam, all those things. Like yes. you step into pain, you step into, you don't run you. And, and instead it, it gets marketed as kind of like Mad Max and Thunderdome. It's like, you get to be <laughs> the guy that's like out there just swinging and mm-hmm. going yeah. where it's like, no, it's like, this is hard and terrifying as a, as a man. Yeah. But because I think society, to your point is marketed men is this certain way. It looks a lot more fun and, and irresponsible. Mm. Mm-hmm. And more given to your beast and not yeah. the nuances of engaging emotionally and leading vulnerably. And, you know, it's so, a little simpler. It's Seems much like. simpler, much simpler. So, okay. So, so anxiety. Yes. Yeah. We got off track of that, I guess. <laughs> this is, this is, I, I want to say this. I think one thing I noticed about this book that's really fascinating is it really is, and you're going to laugh when I say this, but it really is written for parents. Yes. Because I think if you look at, what you've written, what you and David have written, um, you know, it's it's like for parents with the with the trickle down, right? Which so this for is for parents too. about kids. There we go. There we go. And this is for parents this is for parents about you, about you, not you, but about yeah, well, parents no, you can when you no, looked at me that way. About <laughs> Did when it hurt? I was reading, it, I was it like, hurt, <laughs> and I'm just gonna say that. I want to say that out loud. Being vulnerable, being a vulnerable man, it hurt. Um, <laughs> but I think I, I thought that was really interesting. First of all, is just to realize this isn't a book that's like. Because I think as a parent, it is so easy to read those books because it's kind of not about you. It's like how you do a better job, but it's about mm. your kids. This is interesting because it's like you are like, no, 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 mom and dad. I'm looking at you and how we can do how, what we need to work on. And I think that is significant. And I think people that are reading this, it's a little it's a little more like, oh, here we go. Maybe a little you know? more painful. It's, I know. There's I work hope, to do I there. I there's so much grace in no, it. No, no. But I think it's so necessary because I think uh, the, the thing that I love about what you're doing in this book that, that I learned – that morning of March 27th, as you talked to us in that church, was profound. I think about this, I mean, every day since then, about this idea that, like, you are the chief, and I've kind of, and I think I knew a version of this, but not near as succinct as you did that morning, which is the idea that you talk about in this book. Like, well, I'll just say it this way kids of anxious parents are seven times more likely to battle anxiety themselves. And, and what that, if you w- walk that out, and, and what you told us that morning was like, your kids are going to be looking at you for kind of how to feel, Yes, you know? And so I remember your charge to us that morning was like, Hey, when you re you know, unite with your kids downstairs here in a minute, like the (laughs) the first thing you're going to want to do is just go crazy and cry and hug them and hold them for hours and hours. But if you can, and I loved how you put this, if you can try to be as composed as you can be appropriate in how you're feeling, but they are absolutely, and will be, and you really charged us this way. They will be looking at you going, am I safe? Am I okay? Are you okay? Because how you feel is really going to determine how I feel, how safe I feel, and should I be worried? Should I yes. be scared? All these things. And do I need to take care of you? They, you thank you. Mm-hmm. I haven't even thought about that, mm-hmm. but that's another true thing. So I think the thing that's so powerful, one of the main things about this book that I love is that you're really going like, hey, this part of parenting is sort of managing your own thing because your kid is, I mean, I will never forget. It's one of the most succinct memories I have of those first couple of weeks after that, that morning. I mean, 
it felt like at any moment that Annie and I, I could do a sweep of a room mm. and I would find two little eyes like sticking, staring at me because it was just yes. like, they were just like, Something well, you know, you know what I think about when you say that? Good. Okay. We're good. And I mean, it was some of the most poignant memories I have of that day of, of, especially of Xana, just like she would come, Annie would cry or I would, you know, and she would shoot. Hey, are you, what's going on? Like, are you okay? Why are you crying? And it was like, Chevy crying? Are we crying? Mm. And so I think the thing I love about this book is you really do set that up so well. It's like, this is the truth parents like if your kids are struggling there's probably a good chance you may be struggling and so doing that work there and, and i love this question would you say that the most impactful way to curb your kids anxiety is working on your own yeah <laughs> this is i mean so would you say that if you have a, a child that has is dealing with anxiety you shouldn't even think about them specifically you should the I way would to say curb start it. Start with yourself. Ooh, yeah. shot across the yeah. bow. Amy, yeah. are you listening? <laughs> <laughs> that is yes. a. That, let's walk that out. So, okay. for the parents who are listening to that, going like, okay, what do you do? Like, what are the things you would encourage them as as parents to sort of think about? Well, I feel silly saying read the book, but yeah, yeah. I mean, read the book because I think it would. It feels like what I would be doing for the first several months in counseling. Mm -hmm. And so my hope is that can really change the game for you. And if not, if you start to do some work or, you know, say you don't have access to the book and you mm -hmm. just want to journal and start to think through, I do think it helps for someone to ask questions in a way that not only, I mean, I, I think what's the hard part is there are several pieces to it. We've got to figure out why it's happening mm. in each of us before mm. we can really change it. But then we need tools to change it as well. Mm -hmm. And we need, I mean, anxious thoughts, which is, you know, it impacts our thoughts and our bodies so much. Anxious thoughts have so much power that we also have to figure out how to replace them with truth, I think, before we can be freed up from it. So it, it impacts us in several different levels. So it is a hard journey to go on, I think, alone without a therapist or without a book or without a good friend that's done their own work mm -hmm. that can help you work through it to a certain point. Yeah. So, so for the listeners who are thinking, okay, I have, you know, one of my kids is, well, let's, see, let's even leave that out. Let's just say that they're thinking, okay, do I struggle with anxiety yes. or am I just, because in the book you talk about fear, the differences between fear and worry mm -hmm. and anxiety. Mm -hmm. um, so can you kind of, distinguish between the two of those and and what are some ways in which listeners can can determine like okay i think in this with these behaviors this is just fear this is just a normal yeah. healthy fear or is it actually anxiety well i think with fear we're only afraid of something if it's around i hate hmm. spiders but i don't feel i can talk to y'all about spiders all day and i don't feel anything in my body <laughs> right you know um uh, that's a good point and then worry i think is a little more it hangs around a little bit more but it doesn't we can worry and then move on from our worry mm. and i think probably truth be told all of us are worried about something yeah, in sure. any given moment yeah. you know we could each list yeah, three yeah, things yeah. right now that are somewhere tucked away in the back of our mind right but i think for anxiety we can't tuck it away hmm. and so i always i, I went to the fair did y'all go to the national fair mm -hmm. oh i went to the fair yesterday and it was awesome and it made me laugh because i always talk with kids about the one loop roller coaster and i was standing beside it yesterday but <laughs> but the intrusive thoughts uh -huh. which are a hallmark of anxiety so Worst case scenario thoughts, I really blew that kind of thoughts, whatever it is, mostly past and future thoughts come in and they get stuck and they go around and around and around and around. Mm -hmm. And I think even for fear, often it leads, if I see a spider, I'm going to go kill the spider. You know, it leads us to action. It, wow. It's more linear and it's, it's really an adaptive mechanism that God has given us, but yeah. anxiety is just circular and it goes around and around stuck, and around yeah. and around. Yeah, it's stuck. So... One of my daughters right now has a lot of anxiety around the weather. Yes. This is a, I'm, I'm hoping, one of my questions in here was, was how, do, how do you know if your kid is dealing with just a developmental phase mm -hmm. that's coming out as anxiety? And I don't even know if that's a thing. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping it is because maybe then that would be <laughs> this. Grow out of it. Yes. <laughs> um, it seems like, so with, with this fear that has just come on like mm -hmm. like a monster 
in the last couple months. It does that. It is completely, uh, it's like irregardless of whatever information she has. Mm-hmm. Like we, she wants to look at the weather app every single day, definitely every night before she goes to bed. And she's, she's getting, you know, maybe she'll be a meteorologist because she's getting pretty handy with the radar. She is like zooming in. She's like, I'm, I, don't, I can't just see the hourly thing that Apple gives you. I need to go down to the radar. I want to yeah. see. Look at what's um, coming. But it doesn't matter what those things say. No. I mean, lately it's like the weather's been amazing. I'm like, sweetie, it, this is perfect weather right, right now. Like pretty soon we're all going to be miserable and cold. Like right now is the time to be happy about what you're seeing. But it doesn't matter. Mm-hmm. And she, and, and I know that I do this with different areas of life. It's like you just can't, there's got to be one more, like can I check one more email that will give me. So it's this. It's like this false sense of that information will remedy yeah. the the anxiety, mm-hmm. you know. So what? How do you combat that? Because obviously, I can't just I can't go to like another weather website and yeah. give her more information. It's what is it that she needs from me? You know what I mean? Yeah. 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 Well. Yeah, those are called safety behaviors, and they're the mm-hmm. things that we do. And the danger is that that kids, that we, start to rely on the safety behaviors more than we rely on ourselves, mm-hmm. which is the opposite of what you're wanting for her. And so, I mean, two things. One is, one of the things I talk about in the book is how anxiety is always searching for context. And, and so right now, weather is her context. Mm-hmm. And it could be mm. in four months, it's getting sick becomes yeah. her context. Yeah. I mean, and so I think if a context comes and a context goes and she's fine, then I don't, I would say it's a face. But if now it's about this and if in six months it's about kind of throwing up, else. Yeah. right, then I would say, I don't mean she has clinical anxiety, but I would say she leans that way, which means mm-hmm. she's conscientious and she cares and she tries mm-hmm. hard. It's all these beautiful things about mm-hmm. who she is. And we live in this age that it is just crazy rampant among kids, mm-hmm. especially yeah. girls. So I think number one, I would say we want to get her away from weather apps. Because mm-hmm. it's not about the weather. Yeah. It's about the fact that anxiety is hijacking her body and her mind in those moments. And so teaching her skills that she can use, whether it's about weather, whether it's about throwing up, whether it's about getting on an airplane, it doesn't matter. Those basic like breathing, um, grounding techniques, those kind of tools work no matter how it shows up. Mm-hmm. But she's got to trust those tools more than she trusts the weather app yeah, yeah, to yeah. keep her safe. And number two... My tendency is to think when it comes up. So unless, I mean, I think there's something that happens around that seven or eight year age that just developmentally, the way their brains are growing, anxiety sets in. There's also something that happens right around puberty that it kicks up again. Like if I could do a graph of when I see kids, girls, the most anxious, it's those two times. Yeah. So I think sometimes it's really a brain growth, brain changing onset cause of onset but also most of the time I think when you can really get girls to talk about underneath the weather issue she's struggling and feeling like my friends think I'm annoying right now or Mm -hmm. I don't know how to make new friends or not you but something else is going on in my home or there's something I think for most of us when we're more anxious and our thoughts are looping more I think there's a deeper emotional issue at root right and that's what we've got to really get toward work on yeah and help her be aware of because it's much easier to talk about the weather and look at the apps because i feel in control of that but i don't feel in control of the fact that my best friend doesn't want to sit by me anymore at lunch and i don't know what to do john i can't believe it whoa i cannot believe i'm coming in hot i can't believe it Scalding hot. Butchie Bobo, double B as we call him. Butcher uh-huh. Box has done it again. I remember last time we talked, I said, I bet they won't do it again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I was like, d- well, they probably will. <laughs> they probably will. But you they were pushing back. Do. I was. Because they've done it so much, I'm like, how can you do it again? Right. I feel like all the time I'm searching for good deals on premium meats. And until I found double B, Butcher Box, I was going up empty, John. I'm- 
Dude, I totally know what you mean. I tried all my local grocers, mm-hmm. all of them, even oh. in the greater Nashville area. You came area. to my backyard. I did. I started there and then kind of went out in concentric circles. <laughs> and none of them could match the options or the deals that you can get at ButcherBox. It's the best, John. You can yeah. easily find high-quality meat and seafood you can trust. I love, love, love that mm-hmm. when Annie and I want to have you and Amy over, which we ask, feels like every day, and you guys are always busy with the same. It's our busy season right now. Okay, okay. But when we ask you to come over for, and I, I even put this in front of you, beef and shiitake broccoli, uh-huh. okay? Uh-huh. Stir fry. Yeah. I'm, 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 I'm really trying to get you, I don't have to worry about heading to the grocery store, even though y'all don't come. It's all right there. I can just make it right in my freezer so if you don't come. Is this a, like a formal invitation? Like well, it's for always, tonight? It's always an invitation, okay? It's always Okay. Invitation. Well, then, Dave, listen, maybe one of our topics of conversation at dinner can be how impressed we are that Butcher Box is 100% grass-fed beef, mm-hmm. free-range organic chickens. These chickens are so free. They're crazy. They're crazy free. Out Pork there living their life. raised, crate-free, and wild-caught seafood. And guess what else is free, John? I've refused to guess. Delivery. This is too Delivery. No. Right to your doorstep. No. And we say this every time, but they're not just throwing it in the yard. They're not giving it to your neighbor. They're not a block off going, oh, I've read the wrong. They're giving it right to your doorstep, John. And box plans are customizable in both size and frequency. That's crazy. You know, a, a variety of high quality cuts at an amazing oh, value. That's, that's how I describe the whole thing. Yeah. Plus, exclusive member deals, recipe inspirations, guides, tips, and hacks. Now, Dave. It's time to tell our listeners about their special Okay, deal. double B, Butchie Bobo. Butcher Box is giving us a special deal. Sign mm-hmm. up today using the code DADVILLE to receive ground beef for life. John, let me tell you what I want for my birthday, GB for L. And I say every <laughs> every year, ground beef for life. And Annie's always like, oh, how about a, a you know, massage? Uh, I'm like, no, I'd rather have the GBL. Plus $20. <laughs> plus $20 off your first say They have done it again. Yeah. People, that's two pounds of ground beef. Mm. free in every box for the lifetime of your membership. Yeah. Plus, I stumbled over my words because I'm just so so <laughs> taken aback. <laughs> Plus, $20 off your first order when you sign up at butcherbox.com slash dadville and use the code dadville. When you're talking about the tools and the breathing and the grounding and all that stuff, it's like, I'm so grateful for Daystar and the fact that she can go talk to someone because... I'm sure a lot of other parents feel this way. I could I could give her tools. It's almost better if I don't even introduce tools because it then it's, it's oh, then dad. it delegitimizes them right. in her eyes. Sure. You know what I mean? I need yeah. someone else if they say it to her, then she comes home and she has this she has ownership over those mm-hmm. tools in a way that she wouldn't if I had given them to her. You know? And I think the best way you can do it is to say, "Uh oh, Man, I had some looping thoughts today about the technology. We were recording the podcast, and it was not working, and it was making me crazy. And Dave I just had to do my breathing get it together. Dave, let's just here we go with David. And I can't just give him the answers every time. He's got to figure it out on his own. He is a bit ball. But when they can hear you talking through the processes you're doing to work yeah, through your own anxiety, yeah. I think that's more powerful than, honey. Right now, I want you to go do this. Mm-hmm. Okay, this this leads really well to a question I wanted to ask too. So, how do you do like so as a parent who obviously, you know, you're going to have anxiety in your life. Sure. Let's say even the most healthy parent who's like that maybe that's not part of their script in their life. As anxiety comes in, how do you how do you model that? How are you honest as a parent with a kid when those moments come? And again, I don't mean to keep banging this drum, but obviously March 27th is a good example of this. Like Annie and I had such an interesting, you know, and even now still, but really initially it was so hard to know how much do you let your kids see your grief and anxiety? Uh, and then what, what part of you, as you struggle, especially with anxiety, what part of you has to kind of know, like, this is not appropriate for me to, to show them either my anxious you know, whatever tendencies are, whatever. How do you model that in a way that's honest and real so that they have appropriate, I hate this word, but expectations because they're watching you going, oh, okay, so I see dad's anxious, like what you just said about John. Like, oh, he admitted that. And then what is it where it's like their little brains just aren't going to come? Because I remember something, This I've thought about this so much, something that y'all kind of advised early on is just like, you know, if, if your kids come to you and say, hey, is this going to happen again, right? Mm. 
that you were mm-hmm. like, this is one of those parent. This is one of those moments of parent where you just really play the odds, mm. and you just say it's not. Yeah. And you really hope and trust that it doesn't, mm. because more than likely it's not right. Mm-hmm. And you just go, do I know that for sure? I don't. Mm. But right now, for where you are developmentally as a child, it's just a. Me being honest or being, Mm -hmm. it's not going to help this situation. Like, could it? Sure. I mean, anything can happen. But, you know, how do you manage that as a parent? Like, letting them into that, what Mm -hmm. you struggle with, not being disingenuous, but knowing, like, obviously they're kids. There's only so much they can handle with that. Mm -hmm. Well, and it's, I mean, it's true of any big thing we're going through as grownups with kids watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, really, I would say there's a difference between talking about your feelings in front of them and processing your feelings with them. Wow. Jeez, that's good. And so to say, I felt really sad today and I needed to go for a walk or I mm. needed to go write in my journal because one of my friends wasn't very kind to me. That's going to make them feel like, oh, my dad has trouble with his yeah. friends sometimes. Yeah, See, yeah, that's yeah. so normal. I'm okay. Mm. But if then you say, and then this friend did this and I thought – I want to, you know, like get into the weeds of it. That's yeah. not helpful for yeah. them. But I, I think especially with, well, really with any emotion, when we're talking about the things we do to cope, it teaches them healthy coping That's strategies. That's great. That's really great. And so to say, I felt worry rise up in me and these are the things I know to do and mm. I forget sometimes, but here's what I did. And it was so helpful. That's great. That's really great. Are there like certain you know, general benchmark ages for things like that. You know what I mean? I I find it really helpful whenever, uh, you know, through the years, if one of the girls has been dealing with something or it's really been a problem because they can't, whatever it is, they're, they're, they can't empathize or whatever. And then I'll read, (laughs) I'll read one of y'all's books and it's like, well, the age, you know, and up until this age, their brain can't even see empathy. Like that's just not developmentally something that you should expect from them. Mm. Those, I find that to be so helpful, yes. you know, cause then mm-hmm. it's not, you're not expecting something from your kid that they could of, even yeah. be doing, right. you know, developmentally. So right. are there some general benchmark ages where like Dave was saying, like up until age, whatever, you play the odds and you're just like, you got to give them a black and white answer. They, they can't mm. conceptualize odds at mm-hmm. all, even that like, well, probably this is not going to happen, but you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So not really processing your flings, but when they're asking big questions. Yeah. When they're asking for just a point blank answer on something that, you know, as you know, mm. I know as a 40 year old, the complexity of that question Mm -hmm. but they're like just give me a yes or no right i need to know when i go to school tomorrow could is that going to happen again you know yes yes i mean they are very black and white you know it's funny i think post covid i have a harder time saying until x age okay because it has really honestly slowed everything down developmentally Mm -hmm. and so i mean Elementary school kids are definitely black and white, and they're thinking preschool kids certainly, but there are going to be kids who move out of that earlier, mm, right? Adolescents or not, and so I think with younger ones, yes, no, that will never happen again. I mean, any kind of black and white a- answer I think is more helpful for them and is going to make them feel secure. Now, if they press you, then mm-hmm. I think it's okay mm-hmm. because kids always need to feel like you're truthful in an age appropriate yeah. way. And so if they press you, I would give them a little bit more, but that whole idea of let the kids lead with their questions is really important because they ask the questions that they're ready for the information. Mm -hmm. And if they don't Mm -hmm. ask, they're not ready. So if you give a more black and white answer and they don't ask anything else, then I would let it go Yeah, yeah. because that's all they can handle in this moment. That reminds me of the video that you made back in March after the covenant that was so helpful um, where you said, just answer, I think I'm probably butchering what you said, but answer the question that your kid is asking, yes. which is hard for yeah, us yeah, as adults infer, yeah. because we hear a certain question and we know the yeah, huge yeah, 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 scope yeah, 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 yeah. of the event. Right. And so we bring in so much other stuff that they're not even asking. They're right. just asking this one-to-one ratio of a question, right? which I think is tricky for 
uh, parents to just to stay that focused and yeah. Well, it's, it's weird because I think it actually Because our is... anxiety makes us want to talk exactly. more, too. Exactly. No. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Get out of my head. Um, <laughs> so a couple more questions. Okay. Um, you talk about this in the book, like giving grace. Uh, and, and I think especially as a parent, when we think about our parents uh, or being parents, like how uh, you talk about like uh, uh, parents worry and that there, there's a, like a sort of a good version of that. Like we worry because we care kind yeah. of. How... <laughs> Like, can can you just speak more to that, especially the grace part of that? I think about myself, and I can really beat myself up about, why does this stuff bother me? Why do I care so much? But, like, you know, can you speak to that a little bit for the parents who are, like, <laughs> maybe get a little down on themselves because we do worry? Yeah. Well, your quote was, giving yourself grace is more important than trying harder. Mm. There you go. Mm. There you Which go. I thought was, yeah. that was nice to read. I mean, yeah, someone giving you the, the, uh, the okay to give yourself grace mm-hmm. is really powerful. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, and I have, I've never seen parents putting as much pressure on themselves to get everything yeah. right mm-hmm. as I am today and feeling as discouraged in light of that. And part of even coming up with that statement was, I know when I am not giving myself grace and I'm just screwing myself into the ground and trying hard I get angrier and angrier at myself Mm -hmm. and that then spills over to the other people. I mean, I had a friend probably 20 years ago who said to me, and I'm an Enneagram one, so I can have a lot of self-hatred. And, and she said to me, you cannot be that angry with yourself without the anger spilling over onto the people around you. Wow. Yeah. And I think that is especially true about the kids that you love. And Mm -hmm. so, yes. So I think, when you as a parent can step back, whether you just got angry with your kids about getting out the door on the way to school and yelled at them, well, really, you got angry. Is that because... hard for people? <laughs> Sorry, that feels so far. I've heard. I see a lot of people yeah. struggle with that. It sounds like Mandarin to me, but go ahead. But, but I think when you can think, okay, I'm mad because I know they already got three tardies and oh, yeah. the fourth means Saturday school and then they're going to miss the birthday party. I mean, it's good. It's the best of intentions, I, sem- I think, sometimes. Mm becomes the worst of our translations. Yes. And so when you can back up and think, this is because I'm trying really hard and I love my kids, I think that can help us give ourselves more grace and every parent blows it. You know, attachment Mm -hmm. theory, which is what we study the most when kids' brains are developing the fastest. So in infancy, we're we're doing a lot of studying attachment theory. Their brains are doubling in size in those times. Jeez. And what research says is that Parents need only get it right 50% of the time. That's what attachment theory says. So any parent who's listening to Dadville is a great parent. You care enough to listen to a parenting podcast. You are getting it right 90% of the time. And so give yourself grace. That was another thing I loved in the book was you said a couple times, like just the fact that you're reading, you're holding this book right now (laughs) means a lot, you know, that you are the type of parent that is trying to you know, work on yourself and get it, get better. Yes. Yeah. And that you would listen to an amazing podcast well, called Dadville with two well, really thoughtful, more. intentional dads. More about that. I could talk about it all day long, <laughs> don't y'all. Don't hey, you do. guys, I don't know if um, maybe David said this to you. It has been such a fun thing when we travel and speak now, how often parents come up to us, dads and moms both, and say, I heard you for the first time on Dadville. No way. Oh, yes, really? it happens all the time. Oh, so we great. have a couple of plants per city, <laughs> and we, it's yeah. a $50. It's a, and they, they're, you notice they're not at the things. They'll just come in and leave, and that's usually <laughs> right. because we've, right. cars running outside. You they guys. did their job. No, that's great. It's yeah. so that's fun um, every time. And then we take it as an opportunity to be like, we love that so they, much. You're so kind. Can, so, yeah, can I ask two, last, two more quick oh, questions? Yeah. 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 I know, I know you have to go. Um, okay, back to, back to the earlier thing that we were talking about um, with my daughter and the anxiety with the weather. Of course, in the back of my mind, and I'm asking this because I know, not, not selfishly for me because I want the answer. I'm asking it selflessly because I know that there are so many listeners listening that are in the same situation, so it's not for me. Um, I'm, of course, thinking, where did I drop the ball? I dropped mm. the ball at some point earlier. Mm that then she slipped and now is dealing with anxiety because I didn't create a more secure environment. 
And, and I and I also realize when I'm asking myself that question or when I'm telling myself that, I do know part of me is like, no, don't shame yourself because you you're probably giving yourself some false sense of control over the situation. But I also don't want to let myself off the hook too easily. And I'm so I'm curious. Is there something for parents maybe who are their kids are younger than that age of seven where anxiety tends to, you know, creep up? Are there some basic things that could have been done or that like some basic things that you should keep your eye on that kids really need that could walk them past that threshold on the right side instead of with a bunch of anxiety? Well, signs start to show up as young as four and five. And so I, I think if you have a firstborn, I mean, the chances they're going to have some degree of anxiety, it's like 95%, I would say, yeah. if you have a firstborn. I mean, with your firstborn. And, and if you have kids, you probably have a firstborn. <laughs> right, right. Thank I you. I don't know how back, I missed that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so with your firstborn, and I, I mean, I think – at least one of your kids in 2023 is going to struggle with it. And, yeah. and I, I just think we're not, we can't escape it in this mm-hmm. day and time as adults. I think they can't escape it as kids to some degree. And so mm-hmm. I want you to let yourself off the hook in terms of causing it. I want you to keep yourself on the hook for helping them learn, learn healthy mm-hmm. ways to work through That's it. It's a great word. Knowing anxiety is going to be a part of their world. Because yeah. likely it's only going to get worse unless wow. Jesus comes back or I don't know what happens. Right. We all become really chill. I don't right. know how that's going to work. Social moving towards media that. just goes away. Right. right. And I guess the constructive way to frame that question would not be what is the thing in the past that I did wrong right. that I can now identify so that I can specifically regret. Yes. It's more like I want to know what it is because more than likely it's a it's a continuous behavior that that i'm doing that i want to cut out is it is it this the phone is it you know whatever it is it's definitely part of it but i think again i would go back to the best thing you can do from early on is to use language like i was worried today and then i remembered Mm -hmm. you know whatever scripture or truth you have to go back to that that works you through it, that you're just walking those things out in front of them. You're what? practicing failure as a family. You're celebrating their wins and their failures. Yeah. Which is such a counterintuitive thing. Right. Because as a parent, it is so wired into our DNA to be strong. Yes. And to show the kids nothing is wrong. Right. And you can trust me. And some of that is wonderful, but it's wildly unhelpful, it's unhelpful. a lot of times. Right. Mm-hmm. And so I think that that is, a, I do believe, a cultural Thing. It's it's as parents. How do we become more vulnerable in appropriate ways, yeah. which is not yes. normal. Um, you had a question too. Yeah. Um, so my other question, which is is kind of attached to that, is is there or do we know this is nature versus nurture? So I don't know if there's really an answer, but you know, Amy and I were talking this morning, um, and she knew that I was going to talk to you, and so we were talking about anxiety and the girls and all that kind of stuff and and we're both like you know we feel like (laughs) we feel like the anxiety the things that we have anxiety about amy and i as parents we're like we feel like we don't we're it's not like we are just open books around the girls you know what i mean right like the things it's not like i'm talking about my anxiety openly in front of the girls or i feel it we feel like we keep that sort of hidden that's a that's a bad word but for lack of a better word hidden from the girls and yet there's still we still have you know they the girls still have their level of anxiety that we're like you know where's it coming from so our question was is there are we just (laughs) terrible at hiding it and we feel like we're hiding it but we actually aren't and kids are just better at picking up on subtleties Then we give them credit for, or is there actual like genetic anxiety? Like we are passing it along genetically yes, and they're just genetically predisposed to anxiety. Yes. Genetically, certainly it is passed down and they're really intuitive. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's both things, but I think 
you can do all the work in the world and genetically it's being passed down. Yeah. Too. Yeah. So it's both. But anxiety is the most prevalent condition among kids. It's also one in three grown-ups, but it's the most treatable. So there's so much hope. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's what we need to end with. Yeah. Sissy, you are every woman. <laughs> oh, we are so I'd like to hear you sing you. that real quick. Thank you. You're, you're everyone. Oh, wow. We've got to stop there. We don't have the budget. Really no, we don't <laughs> have the budget. <laughs> um, thank you once. The worry free oh, parent. Yeah. Everybody thank worry you free guys. Parents. It's yeah. so fun to be with y'all. Dum, 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 dum